Chapter 31, Sweating with the Big Dogs. About five seconds later, I start to wonder if I've just made a huge mistake. This is definitely not the kind of thing a grandma's boy would do. But is that a good thing or not? I don't live very far, I tell Trayvon. It's just up on... Sit tight, Nikki says. We're going to make a quick stop first. What the what? Now even my sweat's starting to sweat. Quick stop? What exactly is that supposed to mean? Or do I even want to know? The whole time we're driving, Nikki doesn't look back at us once. Trayvon hasn't said a word either. Before I know it, know it, Trayvon screeches up to the curb, and Nikki hops out with his hands in his pocket. Hold it down, Trey. This won't take but a minute, he says. I look up at the storefront, and we're outside Ben's Chili Bowl, a D.C. institution. They make by far the best chili dogs this side of the universe. No lie. Forget about those wannabe dogs that your mother just slops together. These babies are like heaven in a bun, covered in chili and onions. After about 20 minutes, Nikki comes back out with a sack full of chili cheese dogs, maybe a dozen, plus chili fries and milkshakes. Milkshakes, man! Nikki hands Trayvon the sack. He cracks a smile and then says, That's what I'm talking about. A brother is hungry. So I guess he can talk after all. When Nikki passes us a couple of straws and our milkshakes in the back seat, he looks at me kind of funny. What's the matter, chess man, he says. You expecting we were going to rob a bank or something? Nah, I say real quick. I laugh too, but it comes out wrong. Kind of like a goat. I'm trying to act like I hang out with dudes like them all the time, but mostly I'm just coming off as lame. A real Bama. I figure Ray Ray's going to make fun of me too, but he's got his big mouth stuffed with chili dogs. Trayvon doesn't even look back and tosses two chili dogs in my lap. There aren't any fries left. Ray Ray already took all those, but I'm not going to complain. For one thing, Jima hardly ever lets me eat this stuff, and for another, I'm still alive. I'll call that two for two. As soon as we're back on the block, I tell Trayvon he can let me out on the corner. I'll just walk the rest of the way, I say. I'm done taking chances for the day. Congratulations, Ray Ray says, looking at me on the sidewalk. For what, I say. Whatever he says back, I don't even hear it. Trayvon peels out and the smell of burnt rubber fills my nose. The speakers are knocking that new Rick Ross joint. I can hear it blocks away. But I guess I just finished my first lesson. Chapter 32 one thing or another. I'm not even late by the time I get home, but I am in trouble. Kind of. When I open the door, there's a whole apartment full of people inside. I see Dell's and Vashon's mom and a bunch of other people from the school. Even Dr. Yeti's here, looking at something with serious eyes glued to her Kindle fire, the latest version, of course, and a fancy-looking red leather case. That's Dr. Yeti. Kenny, she says when she sees me, how are the chess lessons coming along? Uh, fine, I say. Seems like a complicated question, even though it's not. Half my brain is still back there in Trayvon's ride. When can I expect to play a game against Ray Ray, Dr. Yeti asks me. Soon, I hope, I say, because that's no lie. Meanwhile, I'm wondering if I still have chili and onions on my breath, and if anyone saw me getting out of that jeep. All I want to do now is get to my bedroom and close the door, so I keep moving. I scoot around Dell's mom, squeeze past some lady on a cell phone, and get about two more steps before... Look who it is, Gma says. She's sitting in the living room with a bunch of other people. Mrs. Clark is there, too, standing by a big pad on an easel with a black marker in her hand. The pad says stuff like, save our schools and education first. So I guess this whole big action thing of Gma's really is happening, which isn't great news for me because I know what's coming next. So Kenny, Mrs. Clark says, your grandma tells us you might be willing to stand up and speak at a rally. Have you given it any more thought? Talk about a complicated question. I look over at the door to my room and it might as well be on the other side of the galaxy by now. So I open my mouth and I give the one answer that's going to get me there a little faster. Sure, I say, I'll do it. I mean, what else am I going to say? Everyone in the living room starts clapping for me then. The people in the kitchen lean over to see what's going on, and Jima says, Ladies and gentlemen, meet our new student ambassador. Now those people start clapping too, and the whole apartment's cheering for me, like I'm some kind of perfect model student, or even some kind of superhero. 
What could I possibly say to change things at our school? Why would anyone listen to what's on my mind? Maybe they'll care, maybe they won't. I'm learning more, I'm leaning more towards won't. It's not like a Marcus Garvey or Medgar Evers. If Gma could hear my thoughts, she'd say, no, you're not Garvey or Evers. You're right. And that's all you need to be. But you know what? None of that matters. I'm still bugged out. And that's when my head just about spins right off. Actually, no, not that. More like it splits in two. Chapter 33, Back at the Lab. Chapter 34, Starfish. Later that night, I'm about to hit the sack when Gma comes into my room. Did you feel pressured to say yes to that speech, she asked me. I didn't mean for it to happen that way. It's okay, Gma, I tell her. Well, I'm proud of you, she says. You shouldn't be, I say. Gma looks at me all squinty the way she does sometimes. Why not, she says. Well, I shrug at her. I haven't given the speech yet. Maybe I'll still chicken out. I doubt that, Jima says. You're a brave boy, Kenneth. You're the bravest boy I've ever known. I can't even touch that one. No way. Do you really think it will make any difference, though, I ask her instead? I'm just me, you know? I don't really see how... Kenneth, she cuts me off. And I already know what she's going to say. Have I ever told you the story about the starfish? Yeah, I say. She's told me that one about a thousand times, but it never stops her. I don't mind, either. I kind of like it. So she sits down on the bed and keeps talking. There was a young man once, Jima says, and he came onto a beach that was covered in starfish. They'd been washed ashore, you see, thrown right out of the ocean by the hundreds, thousands, all up and down the beach for miles. Soon enough, our friends spotted an old woman by the water. She seemed to be throwing some of them back into the ocean one by one. So the young man walked down to reach the stranger, and he said... What are you doing? I'm throwing them back, the old woman said, and she flung another into the water. Then our friend looked up the beach. He looked down the beach. All he could see for miles was ocean and sand and endless starfish. Are you crazy, he said. You could be here for days and not even make a dent in all this. What difference can it possibly make? At that, the stranger paused. Long enough to pick up one more starfish, she smiled at the young man and then she said, it will make a huge difference for this one. Chapter 35, Chicken with Fingers. I don't know if I'm ready for another one of Ray Ray's lessons or not, but a few days later I get one anyway. We're in the cafeteria at lunch and Ray Ray straight up dares me to steal some chicken fingers off the steam table. I don't even like chicken fingers. Since when do chickens have fingers? Something just ain't right about that. Are you crazy, I say? Yeah, he says, grinning that Ray Ray grin of his. But this ain't about me. This is about me, and we both know it. I didn't exactly ace that car ride with Nikki. When you end up sweating like a pig and laughing like a goat, you're not exactly a shining example of swag. Still, you're probably thinking, no way, right? Why would I take a stupid dare like that? Good question. I just wish I had a good answer. Maybe it's because Preemie, Quashi W, and Vanessa are watching, especially Vanessa. Maybe it's because I still have something to prove and Ray Ray is never going to stop pestering me until I do. Or maybe it's because I'm a big fat idiot. All of the above, I guess. Whatever the reason is, the next thing I know, I'm sneaking past the lunch line, checking to make sure no one's looking grabbing a tub of chicken fingers with a side of hot honey mustard and getting out of there as fast as I can go. Ray Ray's right there, and we book it out into the hall. I don't stop running until we're all the way around the corner and into the stairwell where it's quiet. Then we get rid of the evidence faster than you can say gulp. It's like those chicken fingers just disappear, but not for long. My stomach's already feeling kind of funky, and I'm starting to think there's more than one reason why this was a bad idea. Good job, Ray Ray says with his mouth full. To tell you the truth, I didn't think you had it in you. And then, all at once, I don't have it in me. Every bite of every chicken finger I just sucked down comes right back up. All over the stairs, all over the floors, and all over my shoes, too. Ray Ray thinks it's hilarious. Way to go, man, he says. You're a regular gangsta now. He's loving this, I can tell. I'm glad someone is. Because to tell you the truth, I don't know what I'm doing anymore.